Attorney Jeffrey Wolf, and joining us this afternoon from Atlanta, Georgia, Criminal Defense Attorney Josh Schiffer. Josh, welcome to you. I want to begin with you, if I may, please. I'm sure you've got a lot to say about this case. Your assessment, please. Uh, you know, there is so much going on with what story's gonna get told. The lacking part in this is, of course, motive. We have the remains of the father, we have the missing mom, we have no other real alternative that's been put forward by the defense pretrial about a justification for why this would have happened, happened absent their client's involvement. And I think that this is still a case that's completely in play and the defense is relying on a strong element of surprise when they're going to try to craft reasonable doubt during the defense portion. Uh, but right now, there's a lot of blank paper out there waiting to be colored all over. Isn't that the truth? Uh, Jeffrey Wolf, um, talk to me, if you would, please, about your assessment of of this case, how it's going so far for the state, uh, if, if you think they're on their way to meeting their burden. So I tend to agree with Josh that I think there's a lot of unknowns in this case right now. And what I'm seeing is I'm seeing the prosecution very methodically going through the evidence, and they're even doing it in a way that's chronological. What we heard with that detective is before he was taken off the stand is that he's gonna be back and he's gonna testify again. So instead of trying to just go through witnesses after witnesses, they're going through the timeline. And so detectives are gonna come in and out of the stand is what it sure seems like. And witnesses may come and go on the stand as well. And so they are doing a very methodical job of laying out a very complex investigation. And the defense is absolutely positively laying in the weeds, waiting to strike. They, they got to strike. Why else go to trial? So they're waiting for it. And I think the prosecution's waiting for them to do it. And so it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Sure. Jeffrey Wolf, Josh Schiffer, so glad to have you both on the program. Thank you kindly. We're going to squeeze in a break. When we come back, we'll show you some more testimony from the mother of Chandler Halderson's girlfriend. That is next for you live here on Court TV. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. Prosecutors in the Chandler Halderson case in the state of Wisconsin have spent the last two days calling witnesses to the stand that either knew or had some type of interaction with the defendant himself. Today, we heard from the mother of his girlfriend, and she testified about what plans for the Fourth of July holiday weekend uh, were in place when it's believed that Halderson was covering up the crimes and what happened afterward. Take a listen. So tell me about what the plan was on the Fourth of July. Um. Well, we have a swimming swimming pool, and you know we asked if they want to swim, they can swim or just eat, and yeah. Where were you going to have this get together? Oh, at the farm. Yeah. Can you tell the jury a little bit about what does it look like? Do I have to face them? <laughs> but do pull the microphone a little bit closer because the, the fans are, are seem fairly noisy right now. Go ahead. Um, it's like a paradise. It's peaceful. It's green. And it's flowers that you don't see. It's just beautiful. So the 4th of July weekend, who all went out to the farm for the season? Chandler, Catherine, James, uh, one of James' friends, Chris, Michael, and Papa and me. Did Chandler talk at all at the 4th of July get-together? about having suffered any sort of injuries lately, had injuries or things of that sort? I beg your pardon? Sure. Did Chandler ever tell you around that time about suffering any sort of concussion or head injury? Oh, we, we, we knew. I knew that he, have, he had a concussion. Um, yeah, he, he fell. 
And was Chandler acting the same or differently than usual on the Fourth of July? He he was he was kind of okay, quiet. Um, but yeah, he was sitting at the table with the other kids. So, what types of things did you do that day? Um, we ate, and um, we were waiting that the kids will be going and juice the pool, and then went and juice the pool. Actually, um, just just happy that the kids were at home. And the kids used the pool. Yeah, yeah. The, the Catherine, Catherine, and um, and James' friend used the pool. Yes. I I don't know if Chandler got into the pool, but I think Chandler always was cleaning the 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 breathe. Yeah. Cleaning the pool. Yeah, he yeah. Um, so you mentioned the next day. Do you know if Chandler went back to the farm on July 5th, which would be a Monday? Yes. And how did you become aware that Chandler went back to the farm? Because Catherine texted me. Um, did you then go out to the farm? I fly to the farm, yes. <laughs> why, do you, why do you fly to the farm? Not so fast. Um, I was just worried. Um, uh, can I have one minute? Yeah. There's not a bottle of water around the corner. Oh. I know there's a smoke. Do you, do you want to take a minute? Um, yes. Do you need a break? Yes. Do you, do you think uh, that you need more than just a few moments outside of the courtroom? Just a, just a few minutes okay. right now. I'll go ahead and excuse the witness. Don't talk about your testimony with anyone, but you can go back to where Ms. Brown is in the vestibule. Chandler can wait by the driveway because um, my fiance sometimes... She, it's a big farm, so sometimes she just like to be with um, just no top. Sure. In the pool. Um, to go to the pool, yeah, she just put her shorts to go to the pool. Okay. And no top. So I was worried that he might. Prior to that day, when you, when you found out that Chandler was maybe going out there by himself, are you aware if Chandler had gone out to the farm much before by himself, alone, without Kat? So the better question is, do you know if Chandler usually went out there by himself? Oh, no. No, Chandler will never go to the farm without Catherine. So this would have been the first time that you're aware of? Yes. Um, so you, you drive out to the farm. You flew out there, I think you said. Uh, yes, because I was worried that Chandler will be, had the check of his life, <laughs> he and my partner. Right. Um, when you get there, um, do you talk to your partner, Cress? Um, when I got there, it was Chandler and Chris talking on the porch. You know what they were talking about? Did you overhear it? Um, but I opened the door and and Chandler looked like sad, kind of sleepy, like you know those like I don't know. He does. He did not look okay to me. But I didn't hear what what they were talking until. Chris says there was some news. Okay. There was some news. Uh, do you know what the news was? Did Chandler, did you hear Chandler talk about it? What was that news? That, uh, that he didn't get a job. Which job? 
The one in Florida. Okay. Do you know why he didn't get that job? Um, because he couldn't, um, he was supposed to be, be there, but his brother got sick, so he couldn't go. And then the next time he fell and couldn't go, and uh, I think they couldn't hold the job anymore because he can't go, he couldn't fly to Florida. Okay. Because of the, the fall? Mm-hmm. Okay. The concussion, his concussion was, was, was really bad. Okay. Um, what did Chandler ask to do or what happened next at the farm? Well, we were very supportive. We were like, you know, he lost, he lost a good job and I was worried about him putting on money for the, for the apartment and, um, We're trying to, Chris and I, we're trying to, to find out how can we help him to, because he looked really, really like down and. Okay. Um, did you all stay together or did some point Chandler go somewhere else on the farm? Um, we, we were talking and then after that he, he basically, basically excused himself to go swimming. Okay. And did he go by himself or did you go with him at that point? No, he, he went by himself. Okay. All right, let me bring in my guests for some discussion now. Still with me, criminal defense attorney Jeffrey Wolf in Denver, Colorado, and criminal defense attorney Josh Schiffer in Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you both for being here. Uh, watching the defendant's girlfriend's mother give that testimony, uh, what were you thinking, please, Josh? I'll start with you on this. You know, it's great the state is using it to paint a more full picture. They're pointing out that his behavior on these visits was a little bit different, uh, trying to paint his actions uh, and add a little bit of suspicion to it. But it's not the full story of motive. You can have a body. You can have missing people, but without connecting the defendant to the why, it's an incomplete story. Uh, so that's something that this witness is, it's doing a good job kind of showing people, hey, there's this farm. Hey, this is the way we normally acted. This was odd about this occasion, uh, uh, thereby addressing the opportunity for him to commit some crimes or hide bodies or do whatever. But really still, we're missing the why. Why would this otherwise very well thought of young man, there was the whole Eagle Scout and, and Bond and how he's a good guy. Why does someone like that allegedly take and commit these horrible actions against his own parents with no justification? That mystery is where reasonable doubt can be found by the defense. Ooh, let's continue this discussion, Josh. I, I like it because on, oh, on opening day, Jeffrey, I remember watching the state and I thought the open was excellent. It was really robust. It told a great story. The prosecutor did an awesome job using the technology and incorporating that into his storytelling the way, especially how he put up all the different accolades this defendant claimed to have. And then he removed them one by one by one, showing pants on fire. Chandler Halderson was lying to everybody, had mom snowed, the girlfriend snowed and parents snowed. And the motive it seems what they're laying out, and I love how one of our guests earlier in the week put it. It was Dave Ehrenberg from Palm Beach County, Florida, the state attorney there. He said it was like dad discovered what a loser this kid was, and the kid didn't want to face the music. Is that enough for this jury in your view, Jeffrey? Or do you think, to Josh's point, maybe the motive needs to be a little stronger from the state? I think that Josh comes from the place that I come from, which is a defense attorney, right? Yeah. The jury always needs to hear the why from us, always. Why is this not our client? Why is this suddenly being put on somebody who didn't do it? Juries always need to do that because they're naturally skeptical of the defense. That is something that we deal with regularly. I find that the prosecution doesn't always need it, but he's right. It's where we focus on trying to find our reasonable doubt, but it's less of what does the prosecution not give the jury of what does the defense make of that? And how do they point out that hole 
and what can they do to try and put something else in that hole a motive somebody else had to commit this crime or in you know maybe not in this case but an opportunity that didn't exist there's just so much smoke here that i think it's going to be hard for a jury not to say that there's fire because where was the body found on his girlfriend's family's farm it doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense that somebody else put them there and that is the issue here is that the prosecution is supposed to be the one with the burden but anybody that's tried a case and i think josh would agree with me on this anybody that's tried a case knows that it's often the defense that ends up with the jury's burden of give us something else give us something else because the prosecution's not wasting our time and i think that that's the issue here is that the prosecution is laying out a very very good case and the defense is going to have to spring something else on the jury at some point Mm -hmm. I, I hear what you both are saying. Uh, this is really a very thoughtful discussion, especially if the jury's thinking what many of us are thinking that, boy, that motive is really weak. It's almost kind of absurd that he's able to snow everybody and live this life where he's secretly playing video games all day long. And like Dave said, being a big loser and then dad finds out and he can't bear to face the music, um, there's got to be something more more sinister at play here if he did commit these heinous crimes, as the state has alleged. Uh, we're going to keep talking about it, just have to take a break. Josh Schiffer, Jeffrey Wolf, thank you so much. When we come back, we'll talk about a four-week-long trial that ended in a guilty verdict. Big one up in New York, you know it, the one of Ghislaine Maxwell. Well, could this case be going to trial all over again? We'll tell you why the defense team is asking for a mistrial. This is big. Stay here with Court TV Live. You are watching Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm your midday host, Julie Grant. Thank you so much for being with us on this Thursday afternoon. So we are in a break in the case in Wisconsin that we are covering for you, the parents' dismembered trial. As soon as the jury's back, we're going to take you back there live. In the meantime, we're turning our attention to another major legal case uh, we've been following for you. It is the federal case of Ghislaine Maxwell. Now she's seeking a brand new trial after a juror in the case has revealed that he was a victim of sexual abuse. That juror, who's going by the name Scotty David, told several different media outlets that he shared his own experience with sexual abuse during the jury deliberations, saying, and I'm quoting directly here, quote, I know what happened when I was sexually abused. I remember the color of the carpet, the walls. Some of it can be replayed like a video but I can't remember all the details. There are some things that run together. Well, that same juror also spoke with the Daily Mail about reaching that guilty verdict. She's just as guilty as Epstein. She's also, I don't want to call her a monster. Um, a predator is the right word. Um, she, she knew what was happening. She knew what Epstein was doing and she allowed it to happen. She participated in getting these girls comfortable so that he could have his way with them. As you know, Ghislaine Maxwell was convicted just last week of conspiring with sex offender Jeffrey Epstein to recruit and groom those underage girls for him and her to sexually abuse. And U.S. District Court Judge uh, Nathan Allison, uh, she set a January 19th deadline for the defense to request a brand new trial. Um, and February 2nd is the deadline for prosecutors to file their reply uh, to the defense motion. And so the big problem here is that this was let out during deliberations, but apparently not in the voir dire process where that juror could have been struck by the defense team. Uh, so this is a really serious problem that could cause a mistrial to be granted by the federal court. Let me bring in my criminal defense attorney guests in Atlanta. Attorney Josh Schiffer is with us and in Denver, Jeffrey Wolf is with us. Josh, I'm going to start with you on this one. Um, what do you think, please? You know, uh, this story just keeps getting more twists and turns with all the people into it. Uh, and I'm also really looking forward to hearing Jeff's analysis, because in my practice area, in my part of the country, once a jury has rendered a verdict, it's sealed up, the jurors are released. It is extraordinarily difficult to disturb a jury's verdict, to collaterally attack a jury 
which was impaneled and was sworn and was questioned and all of the procedure has gone through. Once they've done their job, it is virtually unheard of to disturb their findings. That being said, from what's alleged in the newspapers, uh, this juror lied on the juror questionnaire. The juror questionnaire was very, very straightforward, asking about whether people had personal or family members with a history or story or connection to a sexual abuse or trauma. And as far as everything I've read and seen, this juror said no, only to reveal during the most important part of their service that, in fact, he did have these memories. And as a defense attorney, I'm horrified at a juror lying during voir dire. But I also have the integrity of the courts issue where once a jury has done its job, it should remain very difficult to disturb their work product, which was a guilty conviction. Josh, appreciate all of that. Jeffrey, what do you think about this? Is this enough that it should disturb the jury's verdict? You know, as a defense attorney, I, I always think yes because I, this would not be the first time that I have heard a juror say something after a trial that was different than what they were saying during jury selection, be it on a questionnaire or during questioning, quite frankly. I think there are certain people that have a mission and they wanna get on a jury and they wanna accomplish something in a case. Usually those people can be sussed out through questioning, right? They can, they can trip up or they can admit Finally, in front of everyone, it's a lot harder for somebody with a mission to basically lie bald faced in the courtroom. It's very, very, very hard for somebody to get through that process. This guy did. And he did if we believe everything he's telling the media. OK, because we haven't heard from any of the other jurors. Did this conversation really take place back in that jury room or is somebody self aggrandizing to get his five minutes of fame here? We don't know exactly what's happened here, and that is why it is so hard to overturn a jury's verdict. I 100% agree with Josh on that. It is so hard to get done, I think, throughout our country, not just where he is. I think it's everywhere, because we don't know what happened in the jury room. We may never know what happened in the jury room. The judge is going to have a very tough time saying, well, because he told you know, a newspaper this and a news outlet this, then that must have been what happened, and now I have to completely unwind this entire trial, that's going to be very hard for the judge to do. And so it's it's so sacrosanct what happens in that jury room that it is really hard to disrupt it because we don't know if he's telling the truth. And even if he is, we don't know at what point during jury selection this could have been fixed by the defense team. And in my experience, from the cases that I read in my state, we are held to the highest burden by our Supreme Court to get our job done during jury selection and not go back and point fingers at somebody else. Jeffrey Wolf, Josh Schiffer, you both made excellent legal points here. We're gonna keep an eye on this one as uh, we know that could undo uh, justice that has been a long time in coming for Ghislaine Maxwell. Coming up next, why a little girl who hasn't been seen in two years is only now being reported as missing. We'll explain after the break. Thanks for being with us here on Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. The father of a missing New Hampshire girl was arrested on Wednesday. His name is Adam Montgomery. He was charged with second degree assault, custody and child endangerment, all in connection to his missing daughter. Her name is Harmony Montgomery. This is her. The seven year old was last seen back in 2019, but wasn't reported missing until last week. Court TV anchor Vinnie Politan reports. This is little five-year-old Harmony Montgomery clutching her doll and smiling for the camera. When you look at this picture, everything seems very normal. Harmony seems happy and cared for. But sometimes pictures can be very deceiving because Harmony's world is anything but normal and happy. Her father has been arrested and charged with second degree assault. The victim, his five-year-old daughter, little Harmony. But that's not the most troubling part of Harmony's world. This picture is from 2019, and there are not any newer pictures of Harmony. The photographs of this little angel are all over two years old. 
That's because she's been missing since October or November of 2019. Help us find this little girl. Someone knows something, do what is right and call in. I cannot emphasize that enough. Somebody out there knows something. It's time for people to do the right thing. According to a police affidavit, Harmony's mother, Crystal Sori, says she lost custody to Harmony's father, Adam, because she was dealing with a substance abuse problem. She says the last time she saw Harmony was a FaceTime call on Easter of 2019. Meanwhile, Harmony's father, Adam, says Crystal picked up Harmony for Thanksgiving in 2019, but Adam's girlfriend at the time says Adam told her he dropped Harmony off at Crystal's. Now, back to the assault charges. Adam's uncle claims that Adam admitted to bashing Harmony around the house and witnessing Harmony being spanked very hard, forced to stand in the corner for hours, and scrubbing the toilet with her toothbrush. So while the court system is dealing with the charges against Adam Montgomery, the chief is still looking for this beautiful little girl in the photo. Quite frankly, enough is enough. It's a seven-year-old girl. Let's find her, all right? Let's come together as a community and do the right thing. That's all I'm asking, and I don't think I'm asking a lot. If, if people think that I am, then I'll leave it at that. That was our Vinnie Politan reporting there. Just a, an awful case, so upsetting. Um, and I, I want to bring in our, our guests for some some reaction to this. First of all, uh, Jeffrey Wolf, I'll, I'll start with you, please. When you have something like this, I feel like officers and everyone looking and searching for this beautiful young child are at a disadvantage, right? Because the reporting happened so late. So now we know she's missing, but nobody has seen or heard from her for two years. Um, how does that change the investigation in the search, in your view, please, Jeffrey? Well, anytime they start late, they're they're behind the eight ball right at right at the word go. And so what they're going to have to do going forward to try and locate is to figure out and piece things together as they put pressure on witnesses, as they put pressure on family members, on the parents, on, on the dad charged. They're going to need to basically get somebody to give the, up the information. They've already got the inconsistency. We heard it in Vinny's report there that. He says that she was picked up. The girlfriend says he was dropped off. That means one of them <clears throat> or both of them is lying or doesn't have their story straight. And so now it's time to put pressure on them, probably the girlfriend, of, okay, so you're saying this, he's saying that. Who told you to say that? Because they're going to think it's not true because it sounds like it's not. And so that's where they're going to have to start, and they're just going to have to catch a break. Right. And uh, little Harmony has a biological brother um, named Jameson, uh, who was able to be adopted by a wonderful family. Um, Blair Miller is uh, little Jameson's adoptive father. Uh, and he and his husband adopted three boys and they would have been glad to have adopted Harmony, but she was legally in the custody of her dad. So she was not able to be adopted by Blair and his husband. And Blair came on closing arguments last night and Vinny asked him about how sweet little Jameson is doing. He's five. How is he doing with what's going on with his seven-year-old sister being missing? Take a listen to Blair's answer. This week, we've all been in turmoil as we've kind of been trying to figure out how best we can help, talk with police, talk with U.S. Marshals, and talk with our families about what's going on. Um, we have not talked to Jameson about this, and that's because, frankly, how do you have that conversation with a five-year-old? And how do you have a conversation with one who still yearns to have a relationship with his sister, talks about her? When we go to parks, he feels like he sees her sometimes. He talks to his teacher about his sister. And, you know, when adults can't even figure this out right now, because there are a lot of questions, how do you expect a five-year-old to figure it out? Oh, I thought that answer was so smart and it's just oh so sad and heartbreaking. I know we all feel it, what Blair Miller and his family is going through and all of the people who love Harmony Montgomery are going through. 
Um, Josh, um, tell me what you thought hearing his answer about how when he's saying, look, adults can't even make sense of this awful nightmare. How can my son, who's five, wrap his little mind around it? Yeah, the more you go into the backstory of this tragedy, it, it just gets more heartbreaking. These two little kids were in foster care together, going from home to home. And through the miracle of adoption, the little brother got taken home by what is, by all intents, a loving, caring family. But he kept on talking about his sister because his sister was the one constant in his life through all these changes. And now, because the sister had to stay with the biological father, and in two years, no one's heard or seen from them, they're going to have to deal with this tragedy for the rest of this little boy's life, assuming that no one can find this young lady. And the, the investigation, going to something Jeff was talking about, the investigation's going to focus clearly on this, you know, who picked him up, who didn't pick him up, who was the last person to see her. And there's a lie there, but there's another lie being, what's the betrayal of the state who was supposed to be watching this and knew about this for two years? Exactly, Josh. Uh, a lot of people are gonna have to come forward with some serious answers on this one. Uh, Josh Schiffer, Jeffrey Wolf, thank you both kindly. We're gonna continue following uh, this story very carefully at Court TV Live. Uh, also want to tell you, um, we're getting word that court should be back any moment. We're going to squeeze in a break in Wisconsin and also let you know about a major hearing set to happen tomorrow for accused school shooter Ethan Crumbly. That's next. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Julie Grant. Uh, we want to uh, tell you that the judge is on the bench, but that we have restrictions as to what we can show, what we can't show. Um, we're not able to bring you into the courtroom just yet because the jury's not back in the box. They're not hearing any testimony yet. As soon as that happens, we will take you in there. Um, but before we hit the top of the hour uh, and have to say goodbye to one of our guests, I'm going to get his take on things and where the case is headed. So let me bring back in criminal defense attorney Jeffrey Wolf in Denver, Colorado, and criminal defense attorney Josh Schiffer in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Josh is going to be staying with us into the next hour. So, Jeffrey, I want to go to you uh, first on this one, please. Um, you know, part of um, what we do here at Court TV and analyzing the trial advocacy uh, in every case um, can be really enjoyable. It can be a great learning experience. And every case is always different. Um, tell me, watching from afar, what are you seeing in this case that, that you like in terms of the advocacy and maybe what you don't like? Uh, just want your observations, please. Yeah, I would say on the prosecution side, I'm seeing something that I referenced earlier, which is a really rare way of telling their story. Instead of just going witness by witness, they're going chronological. Witnesses are going to come in and come out. Uh, I find that to be very effective. I find it to be something prosecutors rarely do because they're not built to do it and they're not normally trained to do it. As far as the defense team, it's, <laughs> it's really hard to know what to make of the defense right now because they are being so quiet. They're being so surgical. They are laying in wait for something, and I don't think we're going to be able to evaluate their skill and their strategy until it is revealed, and which hopefully it actually is, and that there isn't just a, we sat on our hands this whole trial, and now they haven't proven their case, right? It's always something defense attorneys say. Sometimes we would say it to the jury, right? I could sit here and play cards with my client for this whole trial, and you'd still have to hold them to their burden. I hope that's not what they're actually doing, because we kind of say it with a tongue planted firmly in cheek when we say it. But I, I really hope that we're going to see something from them that they've been waiting to do. And so I can't really evaluate them just yet. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's tricky. I, I know, especially like you said, with the defense side, because there's no burden. Uh, they don't have to put on a shred of evidence. Ethan, uh, excuse me, not Ethan Crumbly, excuse me, we were just talking about that story. Uh, but Chandler Halderson is cloaked in the presumption of innocence. Um, so that's something that stays with him unless and until the state meets its burden. You both know that very well. And uh, like we know on Court TV, you never know what to expect in a trial. Stranger things have happened. He could testify. Something really wild could take place. Uh, Jeffrey Wolf, thank you so much for spending time with us this afternoon. We'll see you real soon back here on Court TV Live. Josh Schiffer, you're going to stay put. Uh, we're going to hear from the next state witness. The jury's being brought in, and they're going to take the stand. This is all next for you live here on Court TV.
Thank you for being with us here on Court TV Live.